in. Okay. Um, and Mabel, maybe we'll go back to you for a minute. Okay. There were so many decisions initially with the location and the, uh, let me just read a bunch of these. Well, we talked about searching for the president, but the location of the college, you know, the directives, what the <laughs> board was going to be about and the, the goals and the, the whole thing. I mean, how was, what was it like being involved at that stage of something this? A bit overwhelming. <laughs> I, but like I said, the, the men on the board were very knowledgeable and very pro this project, and um, so everybody just worked together and make it work. Okay. I I can't get into details because it's, it's so long ago I can't remember them. Yeah, it's been a while, and there was yeah. a lot going on. Oh, there was a lot going. On. There mm -hmm. were a lot of meetings and a lot of uh, correspondence and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we got the full scoop either from Anna when you two discussed take, uh, her taking your rollover. Mm -hmm. You did actually meet, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how was that meeting? Well, as far as I can recall, it was a very pleasant meeting and it was just questions and answers. And uh, they all added up to it was a job that uh, she thoroughly enjoyed. It wasn't that she was leaving because uh, uh, there was any kind of dissatisfaction. She just felt it would be. Um, well, I left because they thought that California was out of the district. And I, I don't understand that. When you're less than three hours away and we <laughs> who live here still end up at late at the meeting. Anna, what were you doing at the time? I was working for the Human Services Department, Kalamazoo at the time and uh, a job from which I retired and enjoyed very much. So I had been people involved for a long time. And what has kept you so involved with the board for the entire time, ever since? What is well, it students important? and um, the importance of education and that everyone would have an opportunity to uh, be exposed to higher learning. Those who could not afford it, it was affordable education, and for those who uh, were looking for a trade of some description to improve the quality of life for themselves, this was the place to be, and we certainly found it very inviting for students of every echelon to come and be a part of. Well, it's been the most exciting times for you. I think. Um, Exciting times for me, and I'm student-oriented, is seeing young people who had not heretofore had an opportunity to be exposed to uh, the learning process or the higher education, and uh, they were uh, eager to learn, and graduation time always bespeaks uh, what the faculty has done, the administration, the board, the entire team is done when they turn out students who go on to make productive use of their lives. Mabel, you, when you walked away from it, you moved, you moved out of state. Mm -hmm. what, what had been the most rewarding thing about it to you at that point? Well, two things I, I guess would be the answer. One is that it came to vote and was voted in when we got the tax money and the whole thing. And the second is that I was confident we had hired the best president available, the best man for the job. And I still think that. And, and what made him so special? I don't know, his knowledge, his attitude, his friendliness. It's hard to say, it. it's a lot of things go into it. the opportunity to be on the board with him for several years, yes. Dr. Lake. What, what are your comments about uh, I can agree with Mabel that uh, he was a man for the times, a builder, and he, that's what he was called to do, and he certainly uh, um, brought the, the college uh, to the opening point where he had the best faculty 
that was available to him, best staff that he had available to him. I think his choices and selection of people proved to be very, uh, uh, very, it proved to be one of the highlights of uh, the beginning because you can only be as strong as the weakest link and everyone ended up being a team player and the college has been going along those same lines for all of these years. We had to document the successes and why it's the way that it is. It still hasn't been written on a book yet. What's the funniest uh, thing you remember about your involvement? Maybe we'll, we'll try Mabel first. Anything funny happened back then? <laughs> I'm sure there was, but right offhand. Let me think about it. You know. Okay. Anna, any funny stories you have? Well, with Dr. Lake, I think it was when the students, oh, they uh, gave him a vote of thanks that he was one of the greatest presidents that they had ever had, and, and they um, hoisted him up in the air and on their shoulders and carried him around as if he were uh, just a, a man of the hour. And at that time, he was the man of the hour. So that was a vote of confidence that the students had given to him that he was doing a fine job here. And did people, people take pictures of that? Oh, yes. That's good. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Seems like quite an event. Now, Mabel, you're over here. You still haven't thought of something funny, <laughs> have you? No. <laughs> I can think of a lot of things, but nothing I want to. Nothing you want to tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a common thread this morning. <laughs> well, uh, anything you really think is important to be said while you have the chance? Yes. Uh, as you mentioned, we had the support of the community with the, the bank thing. And one of the companies in town loaned us, or loaned us, they, their pilot took us to these other colleges where we were interviewing presidents. And that's quite a gift, you know. <laughs> but those are just two things, but other companies supported us in various ways, either giving supplies or, you know, labor work, something. So you really felt there was a lot of support. Mm-hmm. Something that I just thought of, uh, that certainly Anna could address, uh, the board's feeling reaction when Bob Willem resigned as chairman of the board to accept a position on the faculty to teach business courses. That's probably unprecedented in college history, not only <laughs> ours, but all colleges, it's quite a thing. I don't know any inside story on it, I just knew Bob was a good faculty member. Well, uh, he turned out to be a good faculty member and we thought he w equally was a good board chair. Uh, but he felt, I think, that there was a need. He had enough experience and uh, that he wanted to interact with students. And the easiest way for him to interact with them was to uh, join the faculty or be uh, given the opportunity to serve as a faculty member. Uh, no, it wasn't the most popular stance at that particular time, but we've always taken those uh, uncalculated risks and um, it, he proved to be a very good uh, instructor I, to my knowledge. There. If I may, you, it'd be good if you would start this story, just the beginning of it, and say who we're talking about because I don't think we're going to hear his question. So if you can just tell the story again, who it is and when this was and why it was so well, Bob started as your, I mean, he was voted your chair, right? So maybe you want to tell about your, because he was on the first board. He was our first chairman of the board. He was a very effective chairman. I don't know. Who was he? Let's Bob, start she wants the name. Oh, Bob mm -hmm. Wallen was the original chairman of the board of trustees. And uh, he served the job, did very well. Anna? I wasn't here when oh. he wasn't the 
when he wasn't the well uh bob was I, I can't tell you how many years he did serve as the chairman of the board but uh, six years so that was a full term and um he was highly effective um and uh had the respect of all the members of the board and he did a very good job as such but uh, I believe that everybody is entitled to their choices that they make, and it was his choice that he wanted to become a, involved in the faculty as a faculty member rather than uh, remaining on the board. There was one other thing I thought of. <laughs> um, now I just forgot it again. <laughs> How dumb. Go ahead, I'll think of it again. Okay, well, uh, back to Bob for a second. How the rest of the board feel about his wanting to move into a faculty? Oh, board? I think all of us uh, question, you know, his uh, his rationale for wanting to become a faculty person rather than a board, because they well, they're opposite sides of the fence. One is faculty, and one's board. And so he certainly knew all of the workings of the the board, and uh, he was going into the faculty area. And I don't know how how well the faculty were going to accept him as being uh, on the faculty, uh, having been a member of the board. But there was a give and a take on both sides. And uh, out of the years that he served, I don't think that there was ever a problem that ever arose out of that change that he made. And he proved to be a very good uh, instructor for his class. Did you think of it, ma'am? No, I listened to Anna, and then I get off track. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in general, over the years, how have the relations between the faculty and the board changed? And you know? well, you know, you always have negotiations, and during that time, we're all friends, and we. And when after it's over, we're still all friends. But there's a, a give and a take on both sides. And I think uh, I have been pleased with the results that have come out of most of uh, what has happened. Uh, we have a respect for each other. And we also, um, uh, I think that is one of the things that makes for the, uh, the relationship that we enjoy here. We do try to. Um, see both sides and whatever is the right thing to do that's what we try to do. Excellent. I thought of it. <laughs> okay, you're there. Um, I think one of the, the only one I can remember that caused problems on the board uh, with the public was when we chose a site. There was questions, why is it so far out of town? It's not anywhere near the middle of the, the district and so forth. And uh, Needless to say, the college is growing farther than I think any of us on the original board thought it would. But we did think that someday another campus would be required, and it would probably be up in the Richland area to try and balance this one. But as you know, that's not exactly what happened. But I, I, uh, the, the public didn't care for this location very well, and that was pointed out to us a number of times. And how did you eventually sell them on it, or did you have to? No, we didn't have to. <laughs> we just went ahead and did it, <laughs> and everybody came around. <laughs> what, were the, what were the positives that you presented to the public? Actually, location was a positive in our eyes, and the price of the lots, the fact that it was large enough the college could expand. There was, at times, they wanted us to forget building a college but use old Central High School as the campus. Well, if it's not sufficient for a high school, how it would be sufficient for a commuter college? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, there was a little bit going on about that, but we just thought this had a lot of potential, this location. And uh, the site group that we hired to help find locations for us, they had timed how long it would get from take it from Vicksburg here or Richland here or so the, the timing 
was good. And the fact is, close to I-94 helped. Very good. Any other early controversies you can recall? Uh, you'll have to let me just know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no. yeah, that's nice stuff mm -hmm. to know. Uh, how about uh, you, Anne? Any early controversies? You well, uh, accessibility, I think, uh, were located out on the boondocks, and you had to be visionary to really see the possibility of its growth and development. And um, we started with a... Um, a modular building known as Redwood Hall and um, as a result of that uh, a couple of years well down the road uh, we started the first phase of the building here and then into the second phase of the building here <laughs> and it's been like it's been a story that just continues to grow and grow transportation sometimes we did enter into how do people get here and of course that was, uh, everybody didn't have cars like they do now, and uh, so transportation did play a great part, and the distance traveled. But um, the Metro bus station uh, company, uh, they, on trial basis, they ran buses back and forth uh, from the downtown area here to the college. So anyone who really wanted to come there was uh, a means for them to get here. It may not have been the most convenient way, but at least there was a way at that time. What about sports? Uh, what did people in the community and people on the board think about sports here? And the importance or unimportance or whatever? Well, I think sports, uh, as a part of any uh, institution, uh, we had um, basketball, the Cougars, and we had uh, swimming, and uh, what else did we have? Golfing, and we've had, uh, well, I guess those were the things that we were known for most was our uh, basketball teams and did we do some tennis at that time mm -hmm. so on a good. smaller scale and track I mean just we didn't um, go out I mean it wasn't highly competitive but uh, it certainly was a means of uh, our um, connection with the rest of the colleges within our service area Anything else you two want to say? I can't think of anything at the moment. I Wait think until I get out of here. I'll yeah, think then you'll think of a million things. <laughs> All of the things that... Um, I just... No, I, I believe that um, the, the vision that Kalamazoo had for Community College certainly has proven to be well worth the effort that, and the investment that they have placed in it. And for the people who have gone from these halls to other places, uh, we certainly feel very happy over the accomplishments that they have made. And uh, they have been a testimony that uh, it does work. And how about a similar look at it from your perspective, Mabel? Did you, has it really lived up to the dream or? More. It's much more than I ever thought it would be. I mean, I always thought it'd be a good institution and all that sort of thing, but it's just grown and done so well. And uh, again, not only Dale, but Marilyn, Dr. Slack has just had the world and all to do with that. You can have a board, but it's really the people that operate it because they're on staff and they're the ones that do the job, do the good work. Great. Any other thoughts? Perfect. You're off the hook. We're in. We're in. You guys ready? I think. Yes. I, uh, right, no, I, I, I know you can edit, so ready. Okay. Anything? Just
stay out of it. Uh, so, Bill, let's start with you. Okay. Since you started. Take us back, if you can, the very first year you were here. And let's talk about some of the challenges you had. Some of the challenges? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess the first challenge was uh, Dale Lake convincing me that I should be here. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the phone conversation that I had. I was at the University of Washington in graduate school and I had filled out all of my placement papers and I was surprised one day when he called me and he started asking me a bunch of questions. He said, well, young man, he said, um, how much do you think you ought to earn out here at KBCC? And I had just been in the Peace Corps and earned about $2,500 a year. I was on an assistantship for $3,000 a year. So I thought, man, if I could double what I'd get right now, I'd be doing pretty well. So I said, Six, I don't know, 6000 He says, young man, you're selling yourself short. And uh, at that point, I was convinced that that might be a place I wanted to go. So I came out at spring break and interviewed, and uh, he uh, brought me down to the cornfield and said, this is, the, this is the college. And all it was was just a field is all it was. The hopes in terms of athletics at that time. What were the what? What were the hopes of of the president and did a board a board existed by then? Well, I can tell you what he told me down here at the Greasy Spoon where I had my olive burger. Uh, we sat on stools and he said, um, "Well, tell me, Phil, um, isn't it true that a good coach can make a make a good team out of anybody?" So I'm not I'm not too sure uh, what the expectations were, but he expected a team to to show up. And that first year, there, uh, I coached the basketball team and was the athletic director. And uh, we had about 30 kids come out. They were not recruited. They just found out there was a college. And all of a sudden, uh, 30 kids showed up. And uh, we had tryouts and uh, had a team. And I had a good time. We practiced in 13 different gy gymnasiums that year. We played everywhere. We played our games at Portage Northern, at Kalamazoo Central. Uh, we played at Ott Siegel. Uh, we just played all over. So that was, that was a tremendous challenge, just the transportation and knowing where you were going to play the next day or practice the next day. How about the name, team name? That's kind of unique. Um, Dale Lake, the, the, the president, had, a, uh, had an idea of taking the first 100 students that registered for classes, and he made them kind of a steering committee. And he had them make a lot of decisions, and one of the decisions he wanted them to make was the mascot, and the school colors. And I had done some research uh, with all the community colleges to find out what colors were the most predominant colors used, and red was the most predominant school color. And uh, we had students uh, just uh, you know, uh, suggest names, suggest colors uh, and uh, names of a mascot. And believe it or not, one of the colors that almost, it was second, was chartreuse and fuchsia. And fortunately, blue and white uh, won uh, that particular uh, particular vote. But the blue and white, as well as the Cougars, was chosen by that first 100 students in the old Redwood building in, in the in the cafeteria. That's pretty neat. And of course, now Al, you were two years later. Mm-hmm. Came in '70. And so, how were things in 1970? Uh, still pretty shaky. Um, my first impression when I came down and interviewed, at least I thought it was an interview, and as it turned out it really wasn't an interview, I just met Dale Lake. <laughs> but uh, that was in Redwood, and I remember walking down these bouncing halls, or the floors. Uh, um, anyway, I remember after seeing the place and seeing the grand plan, because the bricks were going up, but that's about all at that time, so all the classes were over in Redwood. But I remember driving home uh, from Kalamazoo. I was teaching in South Bend at the time, and saying to my wife that, "Boy, I don't know. It looked like fly-by-night you to me." But I don't know. It was pretty small, and it was uh, it was very unique. So my impression was, "Who knows? Can't go down. I, I think they're going up." And uh, good choice. So I was here the next fall. But uh, so you weren't. You find out you weren't actually here for an interview, but soon you must have been, or at least called or. Well, it was, it was, yeah, I thought it was an interview. I had a, a, a friend that was teaching here at the time, and I knew they were looking for someone with an aquatic background, and so that's what I was here supposedly to meet Lake. And I met Lake and met, met Phil and met some other people in the old cafeteria in the Redwood. And uh, 
had a number of conversations, uh, but specifically with Lake, and, and Dr. Lake asked me, could we teach swimming uh, co-educationally to both men and women together? And, and at that time, you got to remember that this was before Title IX, and uh, it, things were pretty separate up to that time. And I must have answered correctly, because I said, why not? So um, anyway, I uh, can't remember where, where, where we were going with this, but. No, that's good. I just wondered how it first started. And then your first impression of Phil, what was that? Well, uh, that also went to the Olive Burger place. So I met <laughs> Phil, and uh, uh, he took me out to lunch. and. Uh, uh, we went down to the Olive Burger, same place that Lake took him, so that was kind of a tradition at the time. But there wasn't a whole lot out here. It worked for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we came on board, and uh, like, like I said, when I came, there were at least bricks going up, but we didn't get in the building until quite late. And obviously the, the department developed pretty quickly through a lot of changes in the first you know, two to ten years, I would think. Can you talk about how, how change was managed? Well, we started just with just with uh, men's sports, and I um, hope my memory serves me correctly here, but I know we had basketball. I was the first basketball coach, Lynn Bridge was the first golf coach, and Mickey McWilliams was the first baseball coach, and let's see, what else did Bob we have? Sack, Bob Sack was the first soccer coach. So we had four sports uh, right away, and we built to... Um, See, by 1972, we had eight men's sports because we added, um, what did we add? Let's see, we added golf, cross country, cross country tennis, track. and track. So we had eight men's mm -hmm. sports in 72. Oh, you had swimming by that point. Well, swimming, but in right, 70, yeah. you added those others. Right. Okay. And I can remember, uh, this is a name from the past that uh, some people will remember, but Sue Schoolmaster. <laughs> She was a very, very fine uh, uh, female athlete, but you remember we didn't have any, any female sports here. And I can remember her coming into my office and kind of putting her hand on her, my desk and saying, well, why don't we have women's sports here? I said, well, let's see if we can get them. And I helped her write some things down and um, she uh, made a presentation to the board and within a year and a half we had uh, uh, women's sports. And at the, currently, of course, we just have four men's and four women's sports. And that was right at the time, 1974, was what, two years after uh, Title IX came into effect. So. How about some stories from those days? Well, we had to move the training room. The training room was in the uh, men's locker room, so we had to make that accessible to women. That moved up to what at that time was a uh, first aid uh, uh, a room, and so we abandoned the, the original training room. and that which was in the men's locker room and moved that upstairs. Um, Randonetti, I think, was the first women's coach. I think she coached volleyball think, and basketball. Volleyball and basketball, and those were the first, I think, sports added for women, yeah. and we did that for a few years before they added softball and uh, what else did we add? Tennis? Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, it was pretty interesting. We really did. I was the first cross country coach. And it was uh, kind of unique because I never ran more than a mile in my life, and yet Phil <laughs> Phil twisted my arm the summer of 1970 and said, "Well, you're a swimming coach. I know that you can coach. There's uh, so I know that you can coach running too." And uh, foolishly, I agreed to do it. And so uh, again, like Phil said, there was no recruiting. We just hung a sign out at uh, at admissions, and the first the first that signed up, and anyone that signed up, they were on the team. So we had a team, I think six, in fact I glanced at the pictures on my wall before I walked down here. We had six men that did come out and uh, stayed with us the whole season and, uh, and uh, we set up the first cross country trail. Uh, I remember it, uh, by only having to cut down three trees on the entire uh, course. That course is still being run on the GK, mm -hmm. the high school. But uh, Tell him, remember when the, I can remember you sitting in my kitchen uh, we had our first two years, we didn't have a gymnasium and we had physical education classes. And I can tell you some real stories about the, our classes uh, during that time. Um, we taught a class the first semester that's very similar to the class we're teaching now. I mean, obviously it's been changed a lot, but the second semester was supposed to be a kind of a survey of sports. Well, we didn't have any place to play any sports, so we, all we had kids do is they did reports on sports. 
and two were very, very memorable. Um, I had a girl that was demonstrating bowling, and she was doing an approach. And these are these are now these classes were in Redwood, and uh, as Al said, it bounces, and you could hear anything that went on. She was doing an approach with the bowling ball, and she was supposed to then hold on to the ball. Well, she just kind of, you know, forgot about where she was, and she let go of the ball. And it rolled across the floor, and everybody was just uh, eyes wide watching this thing, and it just go bang against the wall. And it just reverberated, and everybody around came down, thought there was a bomb or something going off. And then another class, we had a guy that was teaching how to saddle a horse. He brought his horse right into the classroom. 